so delighted to do this. I'm Richard Gingras, um, a Senior Product Director for News and Social. Um, I've known Anna for, I don't know, three, four, five years now, and it's just always been a pleasure spending time with you, um, both for the crispness of your mind and the, and the, the wonderful appeal of your sense of humor. So thank, thank you. you. And that obviously, Thanks for having me. <laughs> that always shows in what you do, uh, but, but it's great to have you here. Thank you. So recently, uh, Anna published, uh, uh, just came out with a book, The Book of Jezebel. Uh, but I thought today we'd actually talk about a bit more than that. We'll talk about the Book of Jezebel, but I also want to talk about Jezebel, uh, you know, in and of itself. Um, you know, one of the things that occurs to me, as, as I think many of us in this room know, is, is you know, is as we've seen very, much, very dramatic changes in the underlying media ecosystem, you know, that creates opportunities uh, and, and indeed uh, the need on the part of traditional publishers to figure out how do they create products appropriate for this medium. Um, and in a similar fashion, as, as, as cultures change and evolve, there are also opportunities for you know, new voices to appear um, and address those cultural changes you know, with the audiences that are affected by them. Uh, I think the interesting thing uh, about uh, you know, Holmes and, 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 uh, and Jezebel is that uh, in founding Jezebel, she's really done both, um, uh, both being considerably hard. Uh, you know, figuring out what kind of product can work in this realm, and Jezebel has indeed and continues to work in this realm, and also in, in figuring out how to, you know, address a, a media landscape uh, uh, with uh, an approach that makes sense uh, for, the, for, the, for the new culture, for the evolving culture. And in that with Jezebel, she created which in, 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 in her, in, uh, you know, a, a site which was, you know, unapologetic in its, politi in, its, uh, in its politics and its sensibilities. Provocative, funny, insightful, sometimes profane. Um, Anna, I know, hoped that it would be, uh, and, and I believe to an extent it has, but I'll have you address that at some point. You know, an antidote to the historical superficiality and, and irrelevance of, uh, of women's media properties. A uh, little bit of a background, and then we'll start getting into the, into the whys and wheres. Because you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth. You were born mm -hmm. in Sacramento, raised in Davis. I believe your mom was a school teacher. Mm -hmm. Your dad a park ranger in the, in the National Park Service. Um, in the late 90s, you went to New York. You started out so as a Actually, in the early leave. 90s. Early 90s. <laughs> I'm older than you think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, started out as an intern at the New Yorker. You worked at places like uh, Glamour, Entertainment Weekly, HBO. All, I think, good experiences for you to understand at least the traditional media environment, um, and, and then went off uh, to do what you did uh, with, with Jezebel. Um, you left Jezebel in 2010, uh, and then went on to do the book um, of Jezebel, which if you haven't looked at it, it's a really a wonderful book, and it's, I think, both seriously irreverent and irreverently serious, <laughs> as I think befits the brand. And by the way, um, I don't know if you noticed, but you actually now get a Google auto suggest. If you type in Anna Holmes is. Oh. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> I did. I did. But, but so far, all good, because all it says is Anna, Anna Holmes is the founder uh, of Jezebel. Oh, okay. <laughs> so congratulations. Is, I don't Google myself. That's a, no, that's a, you, I you, like you, Google, you, but I don't Google myself. You, 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 really, you really should put that on your resume. Okay. <laughs> um, so, but let's start talking, first of all, about the creation of Jezebel itself. Um, and before I do, I, I think a, a, appropriate context, uh, when I was going through the book, um, I came upon the definition for lady journalist, mm. uh, which has four definitions, and, and, and I'll read the four. One, thin, pretty, 30-something woman who is sometimes allowed to handle the less hard-hitting television news. Two, a writer capable of covering fashion, celebrity gossip, and the mommy wars, who's better off leaving long-form investigative reporting to more qualified colleagues. Three, just like regular journalists, only without the awards. And four, a smart, tough woman who loves news enough to fight through all that bullshit and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And it seemed, quite frankly, that number four is you. Oh, <laughs> thanks. So, you know, tell us about that, because I'm sure, uh, you know, creating Jezebel was, was was filled with complexities and challenges, and I'd love to hear the story. Okay, you should. Um, I'll tell you the story, but if it goes on too long, then you should, because I. Cause oh, it's, feel it, free. To it touch could be it. a long story. Um, 
I guess I should start with the fact that I had worked at women's magazines before um, I started the site. Uh, and when I say women's magazines, I mean like women's service magazines, such as Glamour and InStyle. I also worked at Celebrity uh, magazines. Uh, sometimes those two things intersect, women's magazines and celebrity magazines. Um, and that was more just kind of a function that wasn't so much my interest, but those, that's where the jobs were in New York and in media. Um, and a lot of my other female friends who maybe had arrived in New York and thought, oh, we want to work for Harper's or The Atlantic or The New Yorker, um, found ourselves working in, in much more commercial publications, a lot of which, or a lot of which we didn't like or, or agree with. Um, and that was me. I did not like, I wouldn't say that I hated celebrity news. I just was kind of um, ambivalent about it or bored by it. And with regards to women's magazines, I actively hated them because I felt that they were patronizing and um, were repeating the same messages over and over and over again to young women, uh, which were along the lines of, you know, be obsessed with men romantically, um, you know, thereby totally pushing out women who were not interested in men. So they were very heteronormative. Um, they were about finding a man. And I, I said this line a lot, so if you've heard it, you're going to hear it again. But they were about finding a man, keeping a man, pleasing a man, making sure he doesn't leave you for another woman. Um, not really about women and, and, and what they wanted, but, but women um, being afraid of losing things uh, at, at all times. And also, they were very obsessed with physical appearance and dieting and so on and so forth. And it was just so snoozeworthy. And it was offensive because you know, me, you know, I could be a 32-year-old and think that I had some sort of um, buffer against the messages that were being uh, communicated in these magazines. And maybe I did, and maybe I didn't. But I, I knew for a fact that there were younger women who, who were probably more influenced by those messages in the same way that maybe I had been when I'd been 18 or 20 or 22. Um, so I, I really hated all the jobs I had at women's magazines because I feel like I was part of the problem. But I needed to pay my rent. Um, I couldn't be like, oh, I'm going to go write a novel. Uh, and at the time that Jezebel first started getting discussed, it was late 2006, and I was working at InStyle, which of all the women's magazines I'd worked for was the least offensive because it was pretty straightforward. It was about, um, you know, there'd be a celebrity on the cover, and there'd be an interview with her, and maybe some pictures from her house, and then someone else's house further in the, in, in the magazine, and maybe a spread of, of dresses for spring, and maybe some makeup tips. And, you know, I mean, it, that was much less offensive to me than how to lose 30 pounds in 30 days or... Um, how to use a hair scrunchie in a sex act, <laughs> that sort of stuff. Uh, so InStyle was actually, again, pretty inoffensive. Um, so I wasn't as riled up about women's magazines as I had been. But in late 2006, there was a woman I'd worked with at a celebrity magazine. who was my friend who was friends with Nick Denton. And Nick Denton owns Gawker Media. And he wanted her to start uh, what he was calling girly Gawker. Uh, that was a placeholder name, I think. Um, <laughs> one, one of his colleagues is over here in the front row. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Girly Gawker was a placeholder name. But uh, so the friend of mine, Geraldine, asked me if I'd be interested in working on this project with her, and I said no immediately. I just the first thing I said was no, 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 because uh, I was a, I was a consumer of the internet in the sense that I bought things on Amazon um, or eBay. I read the internet, and then I read the New York Times online, or I read CNN.com, or I read Gawker, or any number of blogs. Um, but it was still not an environment in which people in mainstream media, or print media, they were not moving over to the internet, really, at least the ones that I knew, it, and, and because they weren't getting paid well. And you know, the whole knock against Gawker Media up until that point was that they, they didn't pay people very well. They were paying bloggers maybe $12 a post. And at, at the time, I was 34, and I was probably making um, $80,000, $90,000 as an editor at InStyle, and there was no way I was going to take a job that was going to pay me you know, half that. Uh, I didn't have a trust fund, unfortunately. So uh, I said no, but then we spent about two hours talking about what it could be. And in, in, in this iteration, it was going to be very celebrity focused. So we just figured we'd make snarky comments about um, celebrity culture. Uh, she then decided, Geraldine the friend, to not work on this site for reasons that are somewhat unknown to me, but it had to do with her wanting to go back home to England to be closer to her family. And so I was asked by uh, Nick Denton and his deputy 
well, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't asked, because they told me that I was going to be running or starting this site on my own. Um, and at that point, maybe the parameters have been broadened beyond celebrity to include fashion. And, 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 and I thought, OK, you know, I can oversee a media property that covers that stuff, because I've certainly worked within those genres before, but I find the way that they've been presented in the past to be offensive. And so I wanted to create a women's site that would incorporate those topics, but not focus on them exclusively, that would treat them or present them in a smart way, that would not purport to tell the readers um, who, who or what they should be, um, would, would not uh, promote conspicuous consumption. Because I really felt at that time, in you know, 2006, 2007, so many of these magazines were all about you know, thousand dollar Louis Vuitton purses, and just like, just it was like a frenzy of acquisition. It was crazy, and and I and I found it offensive. And most people can't afford that stuff, or if they, even you know, oftentimes they were, you know, spending their paychecks on 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 crap. And I, I just felt women were really being ill served. I kind of felt it was tied into the Sex in the City stuff. This like obsession with um, name brands and luxury goods. I felt I felt I found it really gross. So uh, when I was. Um, conceiving of what the site would be, it was pretty simple. It was that it would be something I'd want to read. Um, and it would be a, a kind of rebuke to women's magazines. Because the whole kind of ethos of Gawker Media at the time was that their sites went after the big boys. So Gawker itself went after large media companies on, on a regular basis, like Condé Nast and Time Inc. and Hearst. ESPN was, was um, in the crosshairs of Deadspin, um, Apple was often being taunted by Gizmodo. Um, so it made sense that we would go after women's magazines. And I felt that I knew just the way to do it, because I had a lot of um, decades of frustration with them pent up. But in, in, addition to, in, in addition to that, that would kind of announce what we weren't, which is to say to go after women's magazines would announce what we were not going to be. But we would also you know, have um, content that you didn't often find in women's magazines, like politics. And, and, and a, you know, a, a vibrant, kind of constant, repetitive discussion of politics, whether that's electoral politics or gender politics, because all the women I knew did not just want to talk about fashion and celebrity. You know, they were much more diverse and, and well-rounded. And, and in terms of diversity, that was another thing that had bugged me, which was that the world I lived in, and granted, I lived in New York, which is a very diverse city. Um, but the world I lived in was not reflected on the pages of women's magazines or even in a lot of media. It was very, very, very white. Um, and I am not white. And I felt that was, uh, I don't know if I've used the word offensive, but it was just kind of, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't in keeping with you know, the, the times. It was at that, that point, 2007. And, right. and I was seeing a lot more, it felt like everything felt more global and diverse than it had, let's say, when I'd been growing up in Davis you know, in the 70s. Um, but I wasn't seeing that reflected on TV as very much in magazines. So that is kind of the long story, or, or what I was thinking about doing when, um, when we were putting the site together and conceiving of what kind of features would be on there, and um, when it got named <laughs> by Gabby, who's sitting in the front row, and I hated the name. Um, I, uh, I wouldn't really use the name. I wouldn't, I wouldn't admit to like, the name of the site to people publicly, even like a year later. I just kind of, for some reason, it rubbed me the wrong way. Did it? Um... Did its success surprise you? I mean, what were your expectations when you went in? That's a good question. Well, I mean, I, I felt that I was, I, I went into it with a feeling of um, a little bit, like I was kind of holding my breath. Because first of all, I hadn't been planning to start the site on my own. I thought I was going to do it with my friend. And then she drops out. So now it's on me. And I was well aware of the fact that New York media people read Gawker sites. And that might be a tiny little population, but you know, like their opinion mattered to me. And uh, therefore, the site had to succeed. Because if it didn't, then it would be on me. And this would be the first time my name had ever um, been at the top of something. And I really felt that I had control over whether or not it, it, it succeeded. And, and the way I could control that was that I could just work my butt off on it. Um, so that even if it didn't succeed, at least I would know that I had given my all. Uh, and that translated into me working 18 hours a day and eventually getting burned out three, three and a half years later. But I, don't, I, I had to suspect that there were other women my age or younger or older uh, who were also frustrated and felt ill-served by women's media. I, just had, I, I didn't know that for a fact, but uh, I, I had to assume that they existed and that they weren't just exactly like me and my peer group, but that they were all over the country and maybe all over the world. Um, but I wasn't sure that it was going to work. 
I, I do, there were some naysayers who, I wouldn't say that they were, maybe they were just being pessimistic, but there were some naysayers within the company um, who were my friends, who, who weren't sure after they saw some of the test blocks, which is to say us doing the site, but behind a, mm -hmm. um, a firewall, if that's the right word, before it went live, who kind of went, eh, I don't know, because they hadn't seen anything like that before, and I guess I hadn't either. Um, so I wasn't at all confident that it was going to succeed, but I, you know, it was one of the only times in my life, I think, when, not only when I had total control over something, but that I had to really just believe, and it sounds corny, but believe in myself, or believe that other people would, that if I built it, they would come. Right. Um, I, 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 can you touch a little bit on the mechanics? Uh, because obviously, folks here, we, we don't do editorial. Mm -hmm. Um, how big was the team when you started, and you know, how was it constructed? How many pieces a day? How did you deal with, as you said, uh, w were you paying people twelve post, twelve dollars no, a post? No. Oh yeah. I, the one thing I didn't say is the reason I decided to do it was was because the editorial director of the company, um, when he told me how much he would pay me per year and he was going to match my salary, my in style salary, and I was like, okay, well that changes things because again I don't want to go backwards. That said, at the time. They didn't have um, health insurance or, or benefits. The company didn't. So I was losing out a little bit. But it wasn't, you know, I think I was still under the impression that I would never get sick. You know, oh, it's OK. I don't I have health insurance for a year or so. Um, so I, that, was, that was really the, what, what made me decide to, to go for it. Um, but how was it, how was it constructed? Well, I was given a budget, and I was allowed to hire two people. So I hired um, one woman, Mo, and maybe. March or April of 2007, and then the next staffer, Jennifer, maybe a month later. Um, and that was actually one of the most fun times on the site, was sitting around mostly with Mo, whose real name is Maureen, and just thinking of ideas and, and uh, you know different features we would do. Because we were going to blog, which is to say, uh, put up posts that were reacting to the news of the day that we couldn't predict. But also, we wanted to have kind of standalone features. Uh, that we could count on, uh, and that was. I feel like we got paid to sit around and have awesome ideas. It was really, it was really great, um, and made us excited for you know the site to actually launch. So once it launched, there were three of us. I did write uh, probably four or five posts a day because there were only three of us, and I w you know, we were trying to post once every half an hour or so. Um, as the site got bigger, and I really don't know if I can like pinpoint when this. Like when it got bigger, but it, it was it was successful pretty quickly in that it got attention and it was getting press and there were readers and they were commenting and it seemed like something was going on. But about a month after the launch, I got to hire somebody else, and then I got to hire somebody else. And by I'd say fall of two thousand and seven, I had maybe five people total. Uh, Plus freelancing, yeah. I, I think I, I think I still wasn't willing to use freelancers that much then, just because we didn't have a big budget. Um, and because I knew that I could count on these five people that I had, uh, they, they were easier to deal with. Like they were easier to anticipate, um, like what their various quirks and neuroses and writing styles were like. Um, and so I, I'd say that by you know a couple months in, we were posting like once every twenty minutes. I became very uh, neurotic about scheduling because there was so much going on that we had to comment on. And I wanted it done in a certain order. And in order to keep my brain from uh, melting, I, 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 I would have us post like every 20 minutes or every 10 minutes. So you'd see a little timestamp and say 9 o'clock, 9, 10, when I could have just posted it whenever it was done. Sure. And I edited it. But for some reason, that added some um, order to the chaos. You know, and I, I'd say by the, you know, the second or third year, we were posting 70 to 80 things a day which meant that there were things going up every five or 10 minutes. Um, but it was very highly scheduled in that um, things, had to, things had to kind of balance each other out. So the first post that went up every day was at, at 9. I would get up at 6, and I would start uh, finding stories for the writers to consider doing. And they would usually get online at like 7, 7.30. We all worked remotely from our apartments. So they would get online. I'd see them come on IM. And then we'd have a little chat. And I'd send them stories that they could consider. So the first post was always a gossip roundup. And then the next post was always um, something like the news of the day. Could have been like something hard newsy. 
the, ne the next post after that was usually about politics. Now I know politics and hard news can be the same thing, but I tried to keep them separate, at least in those two posts. And then the next one would be about um, a party that had happened the night before, and, and, and a, uh, the writer would be evaluating the outfits at some party that she had not been to, but like some you know, movie premiere with starlets and stuff. Um, and so I tried to balance out the topics, you know, something serious, something superficial, something serious, but also we would put pictures in between the posts as kind of breathing room, like interstitial. So it was really like, I guess the best way to describe it is, and I had a, a grad student come sit with me for three weeks and watch me work um, for a paper she was doing, and she described it as uh, like I was an air traffic controller. I, I feel like that was a good um, summation. I was trying to not have planes crash. Not that it was really, I mean, it's kind of hyperbole because no one was going to get hurt. <laughs> but, um, but it did feel like there were a lot of things happening all at once, and the writers were IMing me, and I'm looking at an RSS feed, and then you know, Facebook, and e my emails, and there's a TV on next to me, so I can see if something, if Kathy Lee says something stupid on the, on the um, Today Show, so I can clip it. And you know, it was crazy. <laughs> it was totally crazy. I mean, you, you, I was tracking your numbers then, and you, the, you, were? You, know, you built an audience very quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, I was, you know, Gawker, um, I have a lot of regard for Gawker. I mean, people are, are you know, there's some folks who are critical of their sites, others are not. But frankly, uh, you know, Nick and, and, and the larger team have come up with properties that have worked and have been successful and actually make money. Mm -hmm. um, but there are different kinds of impact. Do you, do you have a sense of what the impact of Jezebel has been on Traditional media, particularly women's media, can you assess that? No, but some, I mean, people tell me, but like I, I can't assess it for a couple of reasons. It, it might be reluctance because mm -hmm. I think that if I um, say what I really suspect, then that's somehow self-aggrandizing, mm -hmm. or it could be the fact that I feel, even though I don't run the site, uh, still too in the midst of it. I can look back and see. I can look back and say, yes, something was happening between 2007 and 2010, the time that I was there, that I saw being reflected, like whether it was kind of copycat sites. And I don't mean that in, in an insulting way, but women's sites that, that popped up that were similar in nature and in tone that, that came after us that I felt were kind of imitating our style. Or things I was seeing in the culture, in the like larger, whether it was popular culture, um, or whether it was the fact that I was seeing more uh, discussion of gender politics uh, and feminism in mainstream media where I had not really seen that before. And I could you know, suspect that maybe that was because of what my writers were doing um, and that they were getting a lot of attention. But there was, there was no way for me to, to, to quantify. There was, there was no, I had no proof. It was just kind of a feeling. And I think I was very uh, reluctant to make a direct connection because it was it is and was entirely possible that we just came around at a certain time when um, there was a groundswell or a hunger for that sort of content, and we rode a wave as opposed to or the earthquake that started the wave. Right. Um, you know, like I said, I mean, the, the Gawker properties, they're fans, they're non-fans. I mean, I've, I've been a daily reader of Jezebel from the, from the beginning. <laughs> I have been, absolutely, to this day, I, um, even though it's not as good as when, <laughs> is when you ran it. I have to say that, right? Um, but it's bigger. But I'm a guy, and mm -hmm. and I'm and I'm and I'm not necessarily obviously the target demo. Um, you know, the feminist blogosphere. You know, Jezebel can be a bit contentious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is it a feminist blogger or or, or is it not? Uh, what what are your thoughts about about that and the relationship of Jezebel to feminism? Um, I never called it publicly a feminist blog because that was I felt unfair to. I, what I think are actual feminist blogs, and by that I mean um, not-for-profit, not um, labors of love done by a person or persons that are very activist in nature and, and, and uh, whose content is solely focused on the discussion of feminism and gender politics. Uh, I felt that they deserved that, that, that kind of definition and that I wasn't going to announce that Jezebel was that because we weren't. I mean, we, it's not, I don't, I mean, there's a certain tension between talking about serious subjects like gender politics and making money. I, I don't think that they are in total conflict, but in the end, we were still a, a site that was 
commercial in nature. It was not, it, it may have been a labor of love, but I was getting paid for it, and so right. was everybody else. And, and the expectation was that we would grow and advertisers would advertise, and you know, there was a whole other element there. Um, so that's why I didn't want to use the term feminist blog, but I didn't have a problem with the word feminist. I, quite the contrary. Part of my frustration growing up had been that my peers from a very young age, and by, by peers I mean my female peers, had uh, been very reluctant to, to define themselves or call themselves feminists, even if they uh, agreed with its basic goals. Um, and I think that that's because the word had been uh, dirtied up, especially you know during my childhood, during the 80s and in the 90s, by a, a variety of people. Um, I, I think that it came to mean something that was far more uh, radical and um, uh, hard to swallow than than what it really was. And I, I guess I didn't. You know, I never had a problem describing myself as a feminist because my mother had always described herself as a, as a feminist. So yeah. I had that as a role model. And, and as I got older and I realized that I was, um, that not everyone was as open to, to talking about feminism or embracing it as I was, I became very frustrated. Um, and I think that was the case with women's magazines. Like they, they just didn't get that political. So with the site, we weren't a feminist blog, but we were going to talk about it all the time and talk about it in an unapologetic and repetitive way. Um, I felt that people tiptoed around the word in the same way that they tiptoed around the word abortion um, or that they tiptoed around the word rape because these are all things that might make people uncomfortable. And so we would just, we would not only talk about those things, we would use them regularly in headlines when, when, when appropriate um, and without apology, that we would kind of model to the readers um, that there was nothing to be ashamed of or there was nothing, there was no reason to be tiptoeing around a lot of these more difficult subjects. Um, so people thought of us as being a feminist blog, but I never would again would have publicly said that. I would have said, "Oh, we're a women's site with, um, with you know, where we try to take kind of progressive look at, at the culture, you know, through pop culture." And we tried to use pop culture and fashion and celebrity as entry points into into more serious discussions. That was really the ultimate goal of the site. Um, in my like most ambitious and perhaps um, boneheaded moments, I thought, well. We're going to politicize, a, a, you know, a population of young women who maybe haven't thought about these things or been privy to right. these conversations, and we're going to do it because they're going to come to, you know, to look at pictures of Misha Barton, you know, walking down LA Street, and they're going to stay because they're going to be interested in and the post that comes after it, and they're going to be interested not only in the way the writer um, constructs the post and the language that she uses, which is often humor, but the conversations and the comments that follow, and that was that was an interesting thing is that. I do feel a lot of the readers got politicized, and it wasn't just the work of myself or the writers, it was oftentimes the other readers. Because I, I do think that people are reluctant to be lectured, and so I don't think we did any lecturing in, in the posts. Um, and I do feel like the readers were more, because they'd created such a community, that they were much more likely in many instances to listen to one another. So sometimes we would put up a post where we would leave stuff out on purpose. I don't mean like leave a fact out, but just kind of like the discussion wouldn't be as um, nuanced or as detailed as it, as it could have been because it gave the commenter something to something meaty, meaty to like, you know, chew on and, 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 and talk about themselves. Um, and that was really exciting. Uh, but you know, I, I do think that we did politicize a lot of young women. I, I don't know what a lot is. I mean, I can't sure. get numbers. But and I was hoping we would do that. And I thought that by using, again, these kind of more accessible topics like pop culture or celebrity culture, um, that we could, that we could you know, do just that. I, I'm interested to hear you talk about the, about the tone. I'm always fascinated with the the art and science of crafting the right tone for a site, and, 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 and you managed to do that. But I want to move on to the book, because I want to make sure we talk about the book and also okay. make sure we have uh, time for questions from folks. Okay. Also, a plug for the book. It's available outside the door for the heavily googly subsidized price of $10. Yeah. It's a beautiful book. They really subsidized Superb it. Superb paper. <laughs> really yeah, nice. I'm very grateful. Buy a bunch. Give them as gifts yes. to friends. Yes. So I got to tell you, I got the book last week. I opened it up for the first time to a page in the letter P 
And the first entry that hit me was patriarchy, ah, I thought you were whose say definition penis. was <laughs> smash it. Yeah. <laughs> so my only question there, I didn't realize that Amazon had the technology to detect my gender uh, in a book and cause me to open to a specific uh -huh. page. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm impressed yeah. too. Uh, you're very clever. You should you, join you, forces you, with you, them. You, you pull that off. <laughs> um, but it's encyclopedia, and, and you know, I, I think it's an, an interesting format that you chose. And there, you know, I think there's a, a, a fine history of that, you know, from whether it's John Stewart's uh, you know, wonderful mm. you know, textbook, uh, mm -hmm. Citizen's Guide to Democracy, or you could yeah. frankly go back to Ambrose Bierce and, mm -hmm. the, and the Devil's Dictionary, which mm -hmm. is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, uh, by the way, his definition for apology was to lay the foundation for a future offense. <laughs> I like that. So, what, what, why, what, what caused you to choose the, the, the format? Well, that wasn't the, first, that wasn't the first book idea that I had. The first book idea I had, um, and I'm so glad it didn't happen, but I was, at the time, this was again 2010, and I was still like obsessed with Sarah Palin. Oh, I was just like, she really got under my skin and had since like 2008. I mean, if you go back and look at the posts on the site from 2008, there was at least one or two posts a day just going after her, after she got nominated. I was just like, I just couldn't deal. And so it got channeled into my writer. So I was like, let's do a book from Sarah Palin's point of view that's like making fun of her. Um, and I wanted to do a yearbook. It would be like, it would be a yearbook format. It would be Sarah Palin's yearbook. Um, and, and, and the high school would be DC. So the, pres so the principal was Obama. And the vice president, or vice principal, was Biden. And then she was like one of the juniors. And it would be like a, a yearbook format that she would have written in, or her friends would have written in. And it, but it ultimately would have been making fun of her. Now, I still think that could maybe have worked. But we were not comedy writers. We, we, we could be funny, but like you need like Mad Magazine to, do, like to pull that off, because every single thing in a book like that has to be funny. Um, and we just couldn't execute that. So that got shelved. Also good, because if it, that had actually gone forward and that had come out now, everyone would have been, been like, Sarah Palin, who cares? You know, I mean, it's like she's just kind of, you know, she became much more irrelevant, thank God. Um, so then I thought, okay, well, how can we like sum up the sensibility of the site into a book? And I like reference books. I like sitting around reading atlases <laughs> and dictionaries and encyclopedias. And I also have very fond memories of sitting uh, in my bed as a kid, um, reading like I think it was a set of golden book encyclopedias. I think it was like children's encyclopedias with like lots of pictures about space or you know platypi or, or, or what have you. So I thought, why don't we do an encyclopedia of the world according to the sensibility of the site? And that seemed to be um, OK uh, with everyone else who was involved in the um, con concept and, and, and the execution and the selling of the book. Um, I also kind of wanted to preserve in printed form um, the site, at least as, as I had, when I had run it. Um, like have something tangible that would last because blogs are so ephemeral and you know I would I would meet people who'd read the site or I would talk to like former staffers and we would reminisce about all the posts that Mo did about I'm actually not going to say what it was because it was really gross um, but you know we would have like very fun um, discussions about posts that had that had been put up on the site that had made a splash or that we just loved and I kind of wanted to again have a have a, a permanent um, piece uh, of the site. And I, and I, don't think this, I don't think the book is only reflective of 2007 to 2010. There's a lot of stuff from the current iteration of the site in there. Um, but that's what I know best, is that, is that era. Um, and I think the things that are missing in the book, and there are many of them you know, that I forgot about or I realized too late, are totally indicative of like where my head is at at any given moment, or the, sort of, or the pop culture products that, that, that I you know, are on my radar. And so when someone the other day asked me, um, why don't you have Lauren Hill in there? And I was like, you're right. I don't have Lauren Hill in there. But maybe that's because Lauren She's Hill was kind of, jail. well, <laughs> she'd been in jail. But she was kind of like off. Like she wasn't in my consciousness. And like, I really did try to remember, think of everything. But that was kind of impossible. Um, so maybe there'll be a second edition. <laughs> I mean, a lot of this stuff was written just for the book. I mean, it was you, all written just for the book. Right. Yeah, okay. Always, and yeah. you had a you had a very impressive stable of contributors. A lot mm -hmm. of great writers. A lot of them had um, been staffers on the site, or were current staffers of the site, or had been uh, contributors in some way, or had just been in in that genre yeah. of uh, lady blogs. You know, and I liked their, I liked their work. Um, so, but it really was 
you know, it was a, I, I did not write the book. I wrote like maybe 20 entries and there's a thousand in there. I oversaw the whole thing, but it was the writers who, um, you know, they were given assignments and they, and they executed them very well. Um, and I think you can, you can, you can, you know, tell that there are different voices in there, but it also depends on the, on the, on the post because a post about Sarah Palin is going to be somewhat jokey and mean spirited. <laughs> as opposed to a post about Planned Parenthood, which is actually quite straightforward about the history of, of how it came well, to be. Uh, yeah, so my, w one of my reactions to it was I would start an entry sort of uh, you know, expecting a, a kind of a jokey and snarky, yeah. uh, and, and, and instead it would get something serious. And yeah. you, you, you kind of whiplashed me every time. Sorry. Now and then there, <laughs> which was a cool. But the format, I think, it, it, one thing I love, I think the format makes it much more accessible, right? It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a tome that you feel somehow a responsibility to read and no. this for a reluctance to start. Yeah. You can just you can flip, play you can with flip it. around. And there's lots um, of pictures, which I think makes it fun. Yeah. You know, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to have a lot of visuals to it, just because I really like pictures. Buy the physical book in this it's case. It's better than much the e-book. Much more fun than the e-book. <laughs> it is. Let's go to, let's go to questions. I, I want to ask you just about the tone of the, of the, the website itself. Did you intentionally set out to be snarky? Because that's the gawker voice. And did you mean to be mean um, to everybody or just some select few? I don't think we were mean to everybody. I think we were just mean to like women's magazines, fashion designers who were assholes, um, <laughs> Republicans. <laughs> and would that just be people that maybe you personally didn't like or just all Republicans? All At that point, pretty much all Republicans, <laughs> because they were bananas then, and they kind of still are, at least the, the party. I'm not saying civilian Republicans are all bananas. Um, I, but like, you know, they're, they're, like we could have been, we could have been more fair about things, but like we all had a similar point of view. And a lot of what was underlying the tone on those posts was anger. Um, and I think it was often channeled into humor, because I do think that some a lot of great humor comes from an angry, angry place, or a sense of, of, of frustration with, with the world and, and, and um, how society is structured. Um, but you know, when, when a post had to be angry, it was just angry. And when um, it, it maybe needed, needed some humor because there was really nothing else you could do. Like for example, there's no way to really get angry about Congresswoman Michelle Bachman because she's ridiculous. So you just make fun of her. Um, whereas there's something, you know, it's, I think it's much more legitimate to get angry at, um, for our purposes, uh, the assault on reproductive rights going on throughout various legislator, legislatures around the country. Yes, you can make jokes about stupid stuff that like politicians say, but, but the, the underlying reality of what was going on and is going on was, was not something that was easy to joke about. But you know, it's funny because Gawker was known for being snarky, so that was that was a lot of it. It wasn't, you know, and and also it just happened to it happened to like the first person I hired, Mo um, Tasek, is very um, pointed and biting and very very brilliant and can be extremely mean and very funny. And because she was the first hire, I feel like she also. Um, set a certain tone because I wouldn't describe myself as a funny writer. I'm, I'm, I can appreciate good humor and, and maybe I can be funny sometimes, but there's no way I. It wasn't like I, the, the humor on the site was not be, being channeled from me. It really was um, thanks to the to the specific writers. And, and again, Gawker Gawker's overall kind of snark. But it sounds like you did have some issues that you took seriously and that you kind of campaigned mm -hmm. on inverted commas. Yeah, yeah, I, every single day, you know, we would, yeah, there, there, there was a different tone to every post, but it also depended on who wrote it. And I think one of the great things that Gawker did, and this was maybe a month after the site launched, was they put bylines on posts across all their blogs. Before then, there had been no bylines. So you never knew which of the writers was writing what on any of the sites. And then you would see things like on Gawker.com specifically, a use of the royal we. Uh, I feel like maybe the tone was more not coherent, but cohesive, uh, because there was no way to distinguish which of the Gawker editors or writers was writing any particular thing. And once we got bylines, then I kind of just let the writers go. Because, because also, they were working really hard. Like They worked 10 hours a day, nonstop, um, putting, you know, they would have to read multiple articles and, and, and you know, process them in their head and then somehow spit them back out in, in a well-written, funny way and do all that within the course of 45 minutes. And then you know, I'd edit it and put it up and then they'd do it again. 
like over and over and over and over again. So there was no way that I was going to be able to edit them into a, a royal we. But also, they would have resented it, because I was asking so much of them that I had to let them write in their own voice and write the things they wanted to write. Um, otherwise, I would have had a miserable staff. And I was, again, asking so much of them already. Who's next? Yes. So with your writers working 10 hours a day, it sounds like there was a huge push for quantity. So were, were you trying to, in producing so many articles, just have broader appeal to your readers, or just by the nature of a website looking for traffic? And if so, did that ever worry you about the erosion of the quality of the articles? Um, no one, no one ever pushed me to have it. I think, I think if I had gone to Nick Dett and say, how many posts are we supposed to put up a day? He would have said, eh, 20 or so. I mean, I was putting up 70. And that was not because he told me to or anyone else told me to. It was because we wanted to cover a lot of ground. We felt extremely uh, energized um, and excited. And then the more successful the site got, the more crazy I got, which I don't mean that in a negative way so much. but you know, if, if we were getting a certain result and I was working at 200% capacity, then I figured if I worked at 300% capacity, I'd get a different result. And there was like this energy that um, made us, or me, I should just say me, made me and then therefore make the staffers work even harder. But it was, you know, we were getting stuff back from the readers. It wasn't like we were putting stuff out there and it was just kind of dying on the vine. I mean, there, there was, it, it felt like there was this incredible momentum and there was so much to talk about. Um, that it felt very heady and awesome. But, but yeah, the, the, there were certainly pressures to, to hit certain traffic goals, but I didn't really worry about them that much because we always hit them for the most part. We all, I mean, the site was just growing. Um, there were some you know, months maybe when it, it would grow a little less, but I, I never had, from what I remember, I, I mean, I can go back and look at traffic stats, but I don't remember there ever being like a dip or, there's some, you know, or, or where I was taken aside and, and someone said, you need to fix something because the traffic's not going up. I mean, at one point, um, when Gawker Media was using page views as the metric by which people were judged uh, before they switched to unique visitors, I think it was in 2008, and it became clear that we were going to outdo Gawker.com in page views. And Gawker.com had been around, when, when did it start? 2004? Mm -hmm. 2002? Okay. So, so this, this, you know, Gawker had been around for six years and was a big, well-known media property, and we were going to outdo them in page views within two years of our launch. In fact, in January 2010, you did about four million page views to Gawker's 2.75. Yeah. <laughs> and your edit staff generated about. Are you, four are you sure million. it was page views? Because I feel like we were we had like these thirty. That may have been uniques. Really. I feel like no, this was page uniques were three million for Gawker and in because we were in usually in the twenties and like the twenty million, thirty million page Maybe view. This well, is well, wrong. well, regardless. Oh, I'm we, sorry, forty-four million. Yeah, sorry, okay. I, I missed a digit. <laughs> um, and I was very competitive with Gawker, even though you know they were a different site in some respects. They but were I, thirty-five million, and you were and, and you were forty-four. That's right. Actually, the two point <laughs> seven six was. I, I actually see. I did this analysis. You know, I, 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 I wasn't disbelieving. The, the you. average I just felt like... Jezebel contributor did four and a half million page views. Ah, okay. So versus was... two point seven five for okay. Robert. There, see. Yeah. <laughs> so like that's very that's very exciting when you get that sort of traffic and you just want to keep doing what you're doing, right? Or or do it better. But um, it yeah, it made me burn out and another a number of other people yeah. burn out. Not surprising. Next. Yeah, you kind of talked about at the beginning how when you were going into Jezebel, there was a demographic, demographic of women that hadn't been touched, right? You wanted to go away from like the materialistic, fluffy women stuff and talk about maybe more substantive, you know, whether it's sassy, irreverent, whatever. Um, once you launched Jezebel, what did you kind of learn from a lot of the, the viewers or the readers? Um, did you get a lot of like feedback? Did a lot of people like write in? Did they like a lot of that content? Like this demographic was new to you. So once you kind of entered it, what did you kind of learn from? Uh, that when, when you say, did they like that sort of content, do you mean like the more serious content or did they like? Yeah. The so just, just the edge of, of Jezebel probably that you were taking bold stands that you were maybe talking about maybe some more serious things. I didn't, they didn't write in so much, but they didn't need to because they would just comment. I mean, they, and, they, and, they were, they, and they were there under every post within two minutes of it going up. And then it would just snowball from there. And either they were talking to us or they were talking to each other. And when I say talking, that means you know, having um, 
a nice conversation, or maybe they were like giving us the virtual finger, <laughs> or what have you. I mean, it was it, 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 it was it ran the gamut. But what I learned, and again, this was this was the, the these were the commenters I think modeling for the other readers, because um, a lot of people read the site and read the comments but didn't comment. Um, but the commenters were were like notorious for being any number of things, you know, argumentative, pain in the ass, totally intelligent, and hilarious. I mean, they were. They were great and they were horrible. And when I say horrible, it's just because I would get annoyed with them. They actually weren't that horrible. Um, but they were modeling in the comments the fact, like what I suspected, which was that when that 10:30 post went up about you know the red carpet for the premiere of Meet the Fockers, um, that a, a well-known commenter would, would be saying something funny about Ben Stiller's tux, uh, and then literally half an hour later, there's a post about. Um, rape in the military, and she's saying something incredibly intelligent about that. So you saw within the space of 15 minutes, 30 minutes, that they were able to pivot very deftly and intelligently between hard and soft, you know, superficial and serious, um, which was further underscoring the fact that women are very diverse and have opinions and can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> so, and sometimes you would have, you know, this would be modeled by the writers themselves, but they did have certain beats. So it's very unlikely that the, that the political writer or writers were going to write about um, reality TV. They may have watched it, but uh, it, the kind of diversity of interest um, and versatility was, I think, modeled the most in, in the comments. Um, and that just, again, I guess underscored my suspicion that, again, women can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, but yeah, I didn't get that many emails unless they were, it was someone angry that I banned them. <laughs> We're almost running out of time, so I want to come back to, uh, do you have a question, Anna? Um, my first question is, you expressed some embarrassment, I think, about the name of the site initially, and I was wondering if you could talk about why. And my second question, it, should I ask it now? Yeah. Okay. Is um, thinking about what you were saying about feminism and the aversion slash rejection repulsion to the term. Um, the last time that we had a presidential election, well, the, no, before that, when Hillary ran, I remember having conversations with women in their late 20s, which was my age at the time, and they would say things like, I just don't think a woman can do the job, which um, was really, really horrifying. And I was wondering if you were, what you think about whether um, we're ready for some real female leadership. Um, oh, and thanks for coming. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, to, okay, to the first question, why I was uncomfortable with the name. Well, a lot of the Gawker media sites had made up names. I mean, Gawker, I guess, is a real word, but but Jalopnik is a made up word, and um, Gizmodo is a made up word, or they're combinations of words put together. And we were trying to come up with that sort of name for the site, and I still have like notes somewhere where we were t coming up with ideas, but none of them worked. And then. Um, I think the reason I didn't like Jezebel was because it felt obvious to me, and also because it was a real word. It, with, it wasn't something made up. Mm -hmm. um, so it had a lot of baggage attached to it. And I guess I thought the idea of reclaiming a word that meant something bad was just was too obvious. Um, I, I, I had, you know, I, it's hard for me to even now articulate why I had a problem with it beyond that. And then I actually remember, after the site launched, someone sent us an email, speaking of emails, um, about the name Jezebel, which I was well aware of in terms of the Bible or the Betty Davis movie. But I had not been aware that it was also a word used to describe um, a sexually promiscuous, highly emotionally damaged, uh, mixed race woman, <laughs> and it was used this used this way in the south in the southern part of the United States. Um, so it was very racially coded. Had no idea. Um, someone sent me like a PhD paper about this, and I remember thinking, this is really bad because I'm mixed race, and I, you know the site is not about me. And there was a little avatar which was on the cover, and who's a blonde woman. But um, that compl that made me feel very uncomfortable because. Um, I, I, I believe the term is tragic mulatto. <laughs> that was like what a Jezebel was, like a woman who was a tragic mulatto who was you know, promiscuous or a slut. Um, and I really didn't like all the implications of that. And then I think once I decided that I didn't like it, I just didn't like it. I was being stubborn about it. But yeah, I really wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word. I'd say, you know, I'd meet someone and they'd say, where do you work? I'd say, oh, I work for a blog. Oh, um, 
a blog. Well, it's owned by Gawker Media. Oh, what is it about? It's about women. What is it called? Like, I just like let it go on until I finally went, Jezebel. So, <laughs> in the interest of time, I, I, and I, I want to I conflate Anna's second question mm -hmm. with one that I wanted to get into, which is about women in leadership positions and, 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 and even the notion of, of, of women not necessarily accepting that they can be in leadership positions. So, you know, a, you know, why do you do? How do you? How, why do you do what you do? How are you comfortable doing what you're doing? Who inspired you to? Me? Yeah, you. <laughs> um, well, I don't feel like I'm in a leader leadership position right now because oh, not I literally at the moment. But, okay. Just, but, uh, um, you've been in a leadership position. I I don't know that I had a, ever had a model of of being in a leadership position, so I feel like I fell into it, um, and, and that there was definitely a part of me that was absolutely terrified throughout the whole thing. Even when it was, you know, you think I could have put my feet up and relaxed, I was absolutely terrified. Um, because I didn't know how to be a manager. I had to teach myself how to be a manager. And that's, and that's a very specific type of um, job. You know, it, uh, there, there's, there's no water cooler. You're not, you know, taking your employees out to lunch or shooting the shit. It's very intense. Um, I guess I don't know how to answer that question because I don't know that I've thought that much about it. Um, I, I certainly, you know, am, am in awe of, of women in, in leadership positions that are very visible, like in, in, in uh, business or in, or in politics, um, whether it be Hillary Clinton or, or uh, any number of female senators or um, female Supreme Court justices. Who I, I ran into one of them in D.C. two days ago. Who? Um, Elena, like Elena Kagan. No, I wish Ginsburg. <laughs> Not the Diskagan, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know. Um, Justice Ginsburg. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I, I don't know that I've given, I, I guess I've given women in leadership positions in terms of like politics and business thought, but as totally apart from me, but not so much how it relates to my own life. And I, and I think that, you know, there's still um, a certain amount of inability to imagine, well, I think there's a certain amount of insecurity still about, you know, what am I going to do next, and am I going to be the boss of something, and what will that look like? Even though I've done that before, uh, it's it's not enough to stop me from doing it, but it's not like it, it, it's it comes naturally. Although I was to I'm told I was very bossy as a child, so maybe it's in my DNA, but I do think that a lot of girls uh, have that socialized out of them. Uh, in, in, in many complex ways that I'm not immune to, and that I have to challenge as well. Um, so I'm sorry if I'm avoiding the, no, the question, no, but it's 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 not it's not one I have a good answer truthful. for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can we, let's take one more. What the heck? So for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, Brian Goldberg, who started Bleacher Report, um, put together a woman's blog. And I also read a response that you had to it. Um, I admittedly haven't actually looked at Bustle, so I don't really know much about um, the content, but I'm just wondering if you had um, any tips for him <laughs> or um, kind Start of what your, your uh, response <laughs> well, is to, to that. I, I guess I, guess I um, my tips for him, are, are, I should probably put them in context, because you know, this, this young man got $6 million in funding to start this women's website called Bustle, and then he wrote something that was published in Pando Daily, which was very press release soundy, um, in which he patted himself on the back for um, having come up with the brilliant idea of merging pop culture and politics for women. Like, I mean, it was, it, it was the weirdest. At first, I, I had to read it twice, because he was describing any number of websites that had been around for a long time, including Jezebel, or even magazines that had been around long before Jezebel came like along. A funding proposal It was unbelievable. It was so self-aggrandizing and like, yeah. <laughs> And and like um, naive and like tone deaf and 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 self congratulatory and it was just weird and and it made me mad because it was um, erasing the the existence of of people who had pioneered that space long before he had. It was a lot, it was a bit it was a bit chest thumpy, um, and you know th there's a certain skepticism among a lot of the people I know in the media, especially women, to you know. Silicon Valley bro chest thumping, <laughs> even though even though we're not really um, privy to it because we a lot of us live in New York, it was just, it was just something that was just really rubbed me the wrong way. So I put a I wrote a comment to the post along with a number of other women that wasn't probably very nice. Um, I mean I didn't call them names, but I was angry about it. 
as were a lot of other people. So what advice would I give him? Well, the thing is that he seems to think that he can build his site into a powerhouse with, I don't know if he was, he was talking about 50 million uniques a month. Like that's what he wants, like something um, enormous like that. And it's very possible that he can do that, but it's also highly likely that it's not going to be any good. Because it sounds to me that if he wants to build a, a, a site at that scale with the quickness that he wants, I don't, I don't know if it's supposed to be in five years or what, but that it's going to be a lot of shit throwing at the wall and seeing what sticks as opposed to quality. Um, and, and I also don't know if that really is a way to build a community when there's just you know, um, stuff everywhere. I mean, I, 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 one of my problems with women's media online when before the site started, the sites that were online, like iVillage, I, I'm, I guess that was for like older women, which is fine, but like I'm, I'm not even sure like what- they like older women then. <laughs> It was just like it, it was just like incoherent, you know. In the same way that the Huffington Post sometimes can be incoherent. There's like something, you know, too much going on. Um, so if he wants to make an incoherent media property that gets 50 million uniques a month and makes makes lots of money for him, great. But I'm not sure it's going to be any good. But my advice to him would be like, shut up. And, and I, I don't mean that he should like not start a site, but he should maybe like look at the space and like talk to people and. Um, take in things before he pops off, like he did in that post. But you know, I think that he probably was very chastened by it. It seemed like he was very apologetic by it. And I actually felt sorry for him um, after a while, until the New Yorker article came out. And then there was that picture of him using a woman as a table, one of his female employees as a table, on which he rested his laptop. And I was like, well, OK, I don't feel sorry for you anymore. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I actually haven't looked at that site at all. Just, I, I just think I'm not interested. I mean, at some point, I'll go look at it. Are you bringing it up? It's right there. Oh. <laughs> um, it, 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 it actually managed to nail National Cat Day today. Oh, OK. Wait, I thought it was, I thought it was Uber National Cat Day. Or, or is it? I OK. I, I'm told it's National Cat Day. I thought you, I thought you were going to talk about the crazy cat lady. Well, I was. But I mean, maybe, since we're not getting kicked out of the room, yes, it is National Cat Day. I heard okay. somewhere that your favorite post was about cat ladies. Oh, not no, no. Post, your entry. It's in, not uh, my favorite entry, but but, in, but the thing is, like, I've looked at the text in the book so many times and, and read the posts over so many times that I, they all kind of are a blur to me. Um, and the, what I like about the crazy cat lady entry, which is just an illustration done by a San Francisco illustrator, um, is that it, like some other posts, takes a historically maligned um, uh, type of individual, the crazy cat lady, and, and, and honors her in a very lo loving way. Because I would describe myself as a crazy cat lady. I don't have eight cats, I have one. But just like the certain, there's just certain things that people who have pets or cats, you know, know. <laughs> um, and, and that's why I particularly like that post. Well, thank you, and, and thus proving once again that all conversations ultimately get yes. around back to cats. That's right, on the internet, yeah. So I, 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 thank you. <laughs> I thank you usually for being here with us today, and, and more importantly, for doing what you do, and thank I just you. can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Thank you.